Welcome to the Milestones Motivation and Money Podcast, a weekly conversation filled with stories of business, financial literacy, careers, leadership, and resilience. Setting and achieving goals is key, whether they are related to your finances, business, or career. I hope to empower you with these conversations no matter where you are in life. I'm your host, Angel Radcliffe, and on this show, get ready to change your mindset and start your journey to achieve your lifelong goals. So if you need a little motivation to start your day or just start your next project, tune in and be sure to join our community online at milestonesmotivationmoney.com. Hey, 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 welcome back to the podcast. On today's show, we're chatting with Melissa Flurry, who's an executive coach and founder of The Branded Career. The Branded Career is a coaching and consulting agency focused on developing and retaining diverse millennial talent in the workplace. Professionally, Melissa works as a senior asset manager for a large real estate services firm and has managed nearly $1 billion in property value across the country. She has a passion for all things real estate and leadership development, and I am so happy to have this conversation. I want to go ahead and welcome my girl, Melissa, to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited about this conversation. I'm so excited to have you here because this conversation has really been at the top of the list over the last few months, especially with the great resignation. So many people are looking to how they can further develop their careers and obtain more money. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm seeing that over and over again. So before we get started, how about you go ahead and tell us a little bit more about you and how you started your company? Sure. So my nine to five is I work as an asset manager for a commercial real estate firm. I've been doing that for a majority of my time in my career. And so one of the things that I noticed is that I've always kind of been like, you know, the business type, corporate type. My friends and family would always ask me to do their resumes or help them with their interview prep. And at the time when I started my business, I was really just doing resume writing on the side. But something that I noticed with doing resumes that it always stemmed into coaching and really figuring out like, how can I stand out from amongst like my coworkers? How can I get really get the job that I want without having to like take these lower level roles? And so I founded the branded career really focused on those that are not only just trying to get a job, but really build their career in corporate doing meaningful work. So I would say that, you know, starting off, it was, you know, just those things that you were supposed to learn in college, like resumes, interviews, and sending thank you notes and all of those things. But what happens after you get the job? Like what happens when you need to have difficult conversations? What happens when you have to advocate for yourself to get more money and really focusing in on, you know, just those soft skills so that people can grow in their careers? Oh, definitely. There's so many skills that we're continuously growing as adults. But we feel Mm. as though we should have learned this maybe in high school, first year in college, last year in college, especially when people are focusing on internships or their first job. And life is such a journey. But the Mm -hmm. best thing about life being a journey is the things that you're learning, that self-reflection and being able to share those experiences with other people. Right. Right. Yeah. You and I connected through a program, which was really to help people get more into real estate and develop their Mm -hmm. careers. And we learned so much in that program about opportunities and things that were not necessarily directly in our face. But I think both of us really saw in that program, there are people who lack certain skills that were really right. helping them get ahead or even knowing how much money to ask for in a position. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when we think about corporate America, I mean, everyone has their different thoughts on corporate. Some people love it. Some people hate it. Some people I've heard the saying is you use the corporate to develop your skills and then you go out and start your business. Like you use corporate right. as your training ground, right? <laughs> the perspectives are so different, but then you have the people who will say, you know, they want to be like someone's CEO, COO, CI, something in the C-suite. So they are very heavily attracting the leadership roles or going after those leadership roles and those executive roles. And and they're driven by a title, right? Yes. I have this motto where I say leadership is not your title. 
And I don't know if you disagree with that. I know that you're all about helping people secure those leadership roles, but when you're working with your clients and they're telling you that they want some director, some SPP, whatever their goals are, what advice mm-hmm. are you giving them to help them develop that skill set? Right. So the first question I ask is why? Like, why is that specific title important to you? And I ask that because some, for some reason, people think that once they get the title, automatically they'll gain the respect at work. And that doesn't happen because you're going to still be the same person. So if people didn't really take you seriously, really take your critiques or any of those things when you were associate, it's probably not going to change just because you're a director. Yeah, they might respond to your emails a bit faster, but that doesn't mean that you're going to be the change agent that you want to be. So when asking that question, if it is about finding your voice or having more influence in the workplace, those are the things we need to actually start working at, uh, working on at the position that you're currently in. And I find also that when it comes to soft skills, you know, people think that they can just pick up a book and just learn executive presence and public speaking and all of those other things. But something that I just, we had epiphany on, real, honestly, a couple of weeks ago is that the reason people struggle so much with their soft skills is because they don't know who they are. So they're trying to be something or emulate something, copy something, not realizing that all of your soft skills are really your personality trait. Like there's really no one size fits all when it comes to public speaking. Like, you, I mean, you could tell me like people that you've known to like really speak well, like they don't necessarily follow the same rules. Like it's just something about them, you know, and how they're able to really be confident in who they are. And so I, I just really focus on if we're getting, getting into leadership position, leadership, if you're trying to get into a leadership position, I really want to focus on, do you know who you are? Do you know your personality type? So that way we can match your personality type with the positions that you need to be in. Hopefully that makes sense. (laughs) It does. And it's such great advice. And there's one thing that you said, such as how people want the title, thinking that they'll gain the respect or they can really be that change agent. And I follow, I don't know if you follow Desunda Duckett. I love her, love her former CEO of Chase Bank. And now she's with TIAA. She Mm -hmm. has this saying, I've listened to so many of her talks and she's the mentor in my head along with several other powerful women. But she has this saying, you rent your title, you own your character. And I have a little, I have a sticky note on my desk. (laughs) I remind (laughs) myself of that every day because it's really more of who you are that really commands that respect versus that title. Right. And just to add on to that, women like Tashonda Duckett, Ursula Burns, who was CEO of Xerox. So when I first got into corporate, my first internship was with Xerox. And she was the, I believe the first female African-American CEO of a major Fortune 500 company. And seeing her made me know like, wow, all things are really possible, right? Women like her, women like Carla Harris, who's an MD at Morgan Stanley. And one thing I just noticed about all of them is that they were very sure about who they were as women. And I realized like it when you're in those lower level positions, you're just thinking like, okay, let me just work hard, work hard, and I'll just be recognized. But as I've really matured into my career, I met with a lot of opportunities and I take on those opportunities or at least question those opportunities asking, what do I need to change about myself? Or is this going to change the core of who I am? You know, like I want to make sure that I'm not, that I'm not lacking in integrity with the things that I do. Like, I really want to be able to say that the work that I'm doing is meaningful. And so that in turn means that I have to be very self-aware of where I can actually contribute, you know? And so I just know, knew for myself when it comes to titles and all of those things that, yes, I want to be able to be in positions of power to continue to pull people behind me, to continue to mentor and all of those things. But if I'm going to go into those positions, I can't lose myself as well. Right. I love that, Melissa. And, you know, people were listening. I know many people who often get soft skills confused. And we've been Uh talking about some of those characteristics you need to have as a person, but there are other things that you need to succeed. And I want you to define some of those soft skills for us. Sure. So some of the core soft skills that companies really focus on is the first being, I think, 
communication, right? You know, technically is it's your verbal and your written communication. And it's not until you, you're in a position writing an email or reading emails that you realize that people don't know how to talk. Like the same way that communication gets mixed up in um, personal relationships, romantic relationships, communication is extremely important when you're in corporate America. I tell my clients when it comes to um, new positions or new projects and companies, actually take some time out to pull yourself out of the day to day and people watch and, and really watch and analyze how people interact with each other and talk with each other. Like I started to notice like commonalities in my office that, oh, my boss doesn't like short, e uh, long emails. So I need to make sure that it's written in three to four sentences if I really want his time and attention. Oh, I realized this project manager only understands technical terms. So I need to lay off of giving him all of the deep details. And so when you start realizing how people talk and receive information, it helps you to be a better communicator so that you're not sending 50 million emails back and forth, wondering why the project is solved. The next, I would say soft skill, major soft skill is they say teamwork or team leadership. And it's really about how you interact with people. And I think that's built on the foundation of communication, which we talked about. Like people really respect those who they feel that understand them. They wanna go out their way for those who will go out their way for them. And so you really wanna work on those relationships before you're asking people to do all of these things for you, or at least get to know them on a humanistic level. Now, I'm not saying that you need to know their, you know, birthday or their deepest, darkest secret, but if they said that, oh, you know what, my wife had a birthday yesterday, like it takes nothing but two seconds to ask, you know, the next day, like, how was your wife's birthday? Like people remember that when you're in the workplace. Another soft skill would be influence. And this is heavy as you move into your leadership positions, your VPs, your SPPs, all of those top level positions, because at that point, you're really driving decisions. Like you're trying to get people to really understand your point of view. You're trying to get people to really relocate allocate their um their resources for the things that you want to do like influence I definitely would say is definitely different from manipulation because manipulation is all about self-serving whereas when you're influencing people you're talking about a common goal within the company and what it is that you want some other soft skills is definitely public speaking and public speaking is not something that has to be limited to just speaking on stages it's really your presentations, your team meetings, and honestly, sometimes your client meetings and your one-on-ones. So I would say those are some of the soft skills that come to mind that I feel that people really need to be cognizant of. Right. And when we think about those soft skills, I think that really correlates to some of the changes that we've seen over the last almost two years, sort of with the pandemic there and the great resignation. We have all of these people who have quitting their jobs. I think statistically, and these may be a, a bit old, but as of July of 2021, 4 million Americans left their jobs. And the question that I always see on the news is like, who's driving the great resignation? And of course it's <laughs> millennials. It's people that are in their thirties and early forties. And, and they're saying, okay, I'm tired of this. Or they may be in that mid-career role, haven't made it to that executive leadership role. And it's right. a time to really focus more on what your career goals are. So for someone who has not jumped, maybe they're content at their current job, or maybe they just don't have the courage to jump. What advice would you give them if they're looking to shift their career? For those that are too scared to jump, I, I would just honestly just be blatantly honest and ask like, do you have time to be scared of sitting in the same position 20 years later? Because that is what's going to happen. For some reason, we think that we can continue to delay time and push things off and think about it some more, do some research. But after a certain point in your career, especially if you think of yourself as being a leader and wanting to drive change, like you actually have to take action. Like I realized how comfortable it can be because you know, you're in your career, what, two, three years, five, 10 years, you, you know the people, you know the process, you know your check is gonna hit the 15th and the last of the month. But is that really where you're, you're supposed to be as far as like your influence and what, and what really lights you up? Like at times, like I would also say like, you don't necessarily need to leave your company, like start taking on new projects or transfer or, you know, take a lateral move within the company, do something different. 
like this is the best time <laughs> to do something different because companies also don't want to lose their talent. I've, something that I'm seeing with a lot of my clients is that before they can even have the conversation with their bosses about uh, leaving or, you know, yeah, obviously just leaving, their bosses kind of sense it and they're throwing money at them or saying, what is it that you want to do here? How, what can I do to keep you? Because talent is so like, it's such a commodity right now that you really do have the upper hand. So even if you're like, you're feeling like, okay, I, I'm waiting to be confident, like just have a general conversation with your boss about where am I in my career? Where do you see, see me fitting here and how can I grow? Like you'd be surprised what can come from that conversation. Oh, definitely. And you know, this is so ironic. I literally had this conversation yesterday with a friend. So me and someone, we've been friends since college and she's been at her job for a very long time and mm -hmm. she applied for other positions. She didn't really get the role that she was wanting to get within the company for the promotion. And so, you know, over the years, I've tried to encourage her to look for something else. And, and she texts me and she said, you know, she has a new job. She got a job offer. Mm -hmm. This is the first time that she's ever negotiated her salary in her entire life. And, you know, over the years we've chatted because you said something that can be very controversial for people to stay at the same company and ask for more responsibility. And in my mm -hmm. mind, I'm like, why would you stay and take on more responsibility? Yes, you're getting more experience, but you're not necessarily getting more money. Mm -hmm. So I think this just boils down to the question that I have is, you know, when someone wants to leave or they want to experience new things, yes, the company can offer that, but so many times the company can't offer that market value of what another company can offer. And do you think that it's truly safe for someone to just stay and keep taking on these new projects? I think that it is depending on the company. And I know people hate the answer depends. <laughs> and I, when I tell people to stay or to kind of explore different things, I'm more so thinking about larger companies that can offer you that experience. So I'm talking about your Fortune 500 companies. I'm talking about your big tech companies, multinational companies, because you'd be surprised that a change in office can change, completely change the culture of the company for you. And so if you do have those opportunities to experience something different within the company, try it out. But I will say, and another, I was speaking to a, a, another career coach, is that you do have to be cognizant of, it's like, if you know that you're underpaid, staying at your company will just likely largen, widen that, that gap. Because companies will pay more for new talent whether and, and really don't focus too much on resizing and getting their current employees up to market. All right. And I want to shift gears very quickly because I'm a money mm -hmm. person and I'm all about the finances. So mm -hmm. let's say someone's at their job and they have this opportunity to take on new roles, new responsibilities, but in the back of their mind, they're like, let me just see what another company, you know, has. And let's say they do get that offer but they love their company. They don't want to leave. Do you think that they should just present that offer to try to get a salary bump? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it one thing my clients will tell you, like we have very honest conversations about money because I think the other thing is, is that we have to shift our perspective about what work means in our paycheck. So some of us coming to the office or get a job, we make it seem as if our jobs are doing us a favor by paying us. When in actuality is, is that you're delivering or delivering a service and they're giving you monetary, you know, money back. So you need to be able to have this conversation without the feelings, without feeling that you're being greedy, without feeling that you're doing too much. This is really just about business that you show up to work, you're nine to five. Sometimes you're working 50, 60 hours a week. And if another company is willing to pay you twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 more, then the question you need to ask your company is, can you meet this? And if you're willing to meet this, I definitely want to stay. However, what might be best for me is to leave and go with this offer. Now, those are good words, Melissa, but I really want to get a little bit more transparent. I like to share all the details with my audience. So mm -hmm. let's say you're my employer. I come to you with my offer and saying, all right, ABC company is offering me $30,000 more. I really love working here. Can you meet it? You're telling me no. Now what? Now let, and, and this can be a little tricky. And this goes back to your 
when you said it depends, right? Because let's say you really didn't want to go work for ABC company. You just wanted the offer so that you can try to get more money, but your company can't meet that. And now you're sort of stuck in a rut. You're like, oh my gosh, what do I do? At that particular point, what do you suggest to someone? And I have another scenario after this one. All right. So before <laughs> we even get there, one of the things I work with my clients is going through those scenarios first, because you also need to know what is going to be your response. If A happens, if B happens, if C happens, right? And so if you know that you don't want to actually leave the company, then I would say taking that off and using that honestly as a leveraging tool. So having your career development conversations and bringing to the table actual market data and saying, look, I've been doing well in this position. You've given me these projects and I, I think we work well together. However, this is what the market is paying. Can you right size me? If they say that, no, that they cannot right size you, then the question, this is now a personal decision. Is the money important to you? Because if the money is important to you, then you know that your decision is that you need to leave and go chase it and get the money. If not, then you're going to have to try to figure out something, what's going to make you content to stay there if it's not going to be the money. Okay. All right. And then this is the last scenario for someone who's, they have been aggressively interviewing and yeah. they lucked up with two, three offers. Mm -hmm. They take it back. They're showing their employer. And sometimes they're not really necessarily going in to say, you know, I would like you to match. Maybe someone's like really honed in on I'm leaving the company. But then sometimes you'll hear of companies coming back and they'll offer these retention bonuses. We'll say, they'll say, if you stay with us, we'll give you $20,000 and we'll match yeah. your salary. But now the employer knows that you have the courage to step out and leave. And some people may have it in the back of their mind that's saying, okay, they know that I am not afraid to leave. Sometimes we we envision corporate leaders really wanting those yes people. They want change mm -hmm. agents, but they want people who are going to conform, right? And yeah. they may know like now, okay, Angel's over here and she's going to leave us. <laughs> she's already <laughs> proved to us that she's not scared to go out here and interview. What advice do you give to someone who's in that situation with multiple offers on the table and they're not necessarily wanting to stay, but their company is like begging them to stay? A personal choice for me, like if I got an offer to leave and I'm not, my mind is set to leave and let's say my company does offer me that type of retention bonus, like I'm still not going to stay because just my own peace of mind and understanding corporate politics that, and, okay, actually, let me finish this thought. Just my own peace of mind. Um, <laughs> like I'm not going to stay. It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And so I guess what I, I really work with my clients is like, aside from the money, like I, I understand the money is a big, big piece of it. Like, what do you want out of your career? And that's why like the, the people I work with, like they're 10 years, about 10 to 15 years post, post-grad, maybe they have their MBA or any other post, post-grad degree, secondary degree, like we, you're going to make money. Like you, you're going to make your six figures. Like you're, you're going to get your bonuses. But what's going to drive you more than the money? Because now you have options as far as projects, clients, location, all of these things that really light you up. So if you have a company, if you know that the company is where you want to stay, maybe they're not paying you more, then it's a question of like, how long can I do this dance with my company? But if this company is, you've been new, you were trying to leave and um, they're going to pay you more money, what, why would you want to stay? but that's your choice. Right. And you know, that's a hard decision for so many people. And I know we've discussed that. I was a guest on your podcast and we talked mm -hmm. about some of my career journey, but, and I've learned that lesson, you know, money is not always the answer jumping for the money, but that's a whole nother story. And if you want to hear that episode, listen to Melissa's podcast, but you yes. know, Melissa, when we're talking about salary and, you know, if you should jump and take a new offer, I want to get more into negotiation because mm -hmm. If even if it's for someone at their current job or for someone interviewing for a new job, some people think negotiation is only about the salary and it's nope. not. So can you delve into that <laughs> for us? Yeah. So um, salary is a, a, always a huge component because that's what you're going to be paying on a biweekly, semi-monthly basis. But some of the things that I've seen great success with my clients is that if they can't meet you in the salary that you want or the range that you want, 
sometimes they'll negotiate. I had one client negotiate the difference of what they, where they were able to meet her and where they, um, where she wanted. And she got that as a sign on bonus. And so sometimes you can get lump sums up front with some of these companies. Another thing um, that I've seen my clients do is, is negotiate their vacation time. Like there are just so many like non-monetary things that you can negotiate that adds to, you know, your quality of life or your work-life balance. So getting more vacation time. Another thing that I've seen is shortening your probationary periods. So, so for some companies, it might be 90 days. You might be able to shorten it to 30 days or 60 days. And so I just, uh, oh, the other thing that I've actually seen most recently, my client negotiated her contract for a specific salary in the six months. And once they, this nonprofit got their grant, she would be bumped to another salary and a title change. So there's many different ways that you can make a new offer work for you. It's just kind of thinking through the scenarios that really work in your favor. Oh, that's awesome advice. And I'm sure people who are listening are going to go back, rewind, and take some notes because so many times people just don't know this information and they find out after the fact, like, oh, I could have negotiated more vacation time or I could have asked for more of a sign-on bonus. Of course, we're always happy to get the sign-on bonus. But even in, even in my job I have now, some of my coworkers, we, we talk very transparently about salaries, about bonuses. And, you know, we have a little group chat with me and a few friends, a few close friends, not everyone, but we, we talk and, you know, how much was your bonus? All right. How much was, <laughs> so yeah. people don't know, you can even go back and ask for that salary, salary review. Even if you received a raise, you want to make sure it's still comparable to people in your department and your group or within that particular region. And, you know, it's information that's definitely, I'd say quiet as cup. It's really like in that HR world and people need to reach out, ask questions and it's okay. Find a friend, find someone you can confide in, but really learning how to take those negotiation skills with you as you move forward in your career, as you're trying to seek that executive role, because that's where the big money comes in. Right. <laughs> the big and, bonuses, right? And I know it's hard, right? Like we, we get very attached to our jobs and our work. But like when it comes to money, like you sometimes you really do need to be very black and white about your decisions. If you know that you need to make, you know, and it's feasible for you to make, I don't know, let's say a hundred thousand dollars, right? And your company is saying, you know, look, we can only meet you at 85. Like for you, if you know your goals, and that's one thing I worked through even before the salary negotiation with my with my clients is what are your investment goals? What's your debt elimination goals? What, where do you see yourself in the next like year or so financially and what salary do you need to make in order to get there? And so when my clients run through those exercises and they see the number, it makes it so much easier for them to turn down positions, which I call um, knowing your walk away number, turn down positions and walk away from positions that can't meet the number that you need and really continuously go after positions that can pay them what it is that they, they really want to make. That's really great advice. And you said something that's now it's, it's making me come up with a new question. So you talked about the <laughs> walk away number and yeah. unlink, we're both on LinkedIn. The recruiters are often hitting people up. I get recruiters in my inbox every week, 10 to 20 recruiters. Oh, are you want, are you looking for a new role? Are you this or that? <laughs> and sometimes it's totally random or I don't know how they're, how they're identifying people. Sometimes it's very intentional and, you know, they'll say, you know, what the range is. And sometimes I'm offended. I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> look at my profile. <laughs> so, right. You don't think that I'm overqualified for this role? <laughs> <laughs> ask them. I've gotten to the point where one, I've become so confident. And we talked about confidence on your podcast. Like really, like as you grow in your career, you gain that confidence to ask those questions. And, and it shouldn't necessarily be with growth. You should just ask any, anyway, but I'm, I was asking like, did you look at my profile? Why do you think that I would want this position <laughs> with my experience? And my <laughs> friend, she cracks up laughing. She's like, I can't believe that you're actually being that blunt with recruiters. But why not? And even, you know, when someone is reaching out for a position that you may be interested in, I find it best practice to ask up front, hey, do you mind sharing the range for this role? Not necessarily saying like what exactly you're looking for because you want to know what they're paying first. And mm -hmm. some people will share, some people won't, but you don't want to waste your time going through that interview process. So what are your thoughts around that? Or how are you advising your clients to really get to the number to make sure that role is aligned to what their salary goals are? 
Yeah, I have a mask up front. <laughs> Don't I ain't gonna waste your time. Don't waste my time. Um, like I, I need to gauge whether or not just financially I could take on a position like that. And so, like, of course, the caveat is if the position in the company is interesting enough for you not to really care about the money. And still, we're still working on, okay, what is your walk away number? Because if it can't even meet your bare minimum, then is this really the best position for you? But I definitely suggest asking up front. Ask them. And sometimes the recruiters get a bit, you know, kind of iffy about wanting to tell you those numbers, but I have no problem asking hiring managers as well. Right. And, you know, we talked about walk away number. So one tip that I'll share with listeners is if you're confident in the role that you have and you like your job and you just want to really explore what other opportunities are, why not play hardball? Yeah. And like, and like I said, for me, it's not always about the money. I had a company reach out. They told me their salary, but then when they told me their vacation time, I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> this is not going to work for me. And they're like, you know, can we change your mind? I'm like, no. Because once I heard about the benefits and everything, I'm like, "Mm -mm." right. It's, you know what? It's such a good conversation that we've been having. And I know we're getting to the end of the show, but this can go on and on. And I definitely want to have this conversation on a broader uh, spectrum and maybe even have a panel discussion and bringing some people in if you're open to doing something around the beginning of the year, because so many jobs, that's when so many people are hiring. And so many people have that light bulb moment of like, "Mm, maybe I should start looking for a job and they're looking to hop in the spring. But yeah. And can I just add that the beginning of the the year, like you said, is, is a really good time. But then also just think about it psychologically. Like most people are not leaving their positions because around February, March, everyone's getting their bonuses <laughs> and they're waiting to collect those big checks before they leave. And that opens up a you know, vacant position. So if you're ready to look for a position or get into a new role, start networking now. Start meeting with recruiters now, because I guarantee you by that February, March, you're going to get those flood of messages and job postings. Definitely. Really great advice. And Melissa, everyone I have on the show, I like to ask one question. You know, I'm a financial educator. I'm all about money, but a part of my brand, (laughs) (laughs) a part of my brand, I use the phrase balling on a budget. And Uh I would love to know what does balling on a budget mean to you? Uh, For me, it, it's knowing that you can, you can, knowing that you can buy something, but your financial goals are way bigger that you don't do it. And that really showed up for me a couple of weeks ago because I mean, you know, like a lot of people, like you like, like nice things, <laughs> you know, and there was this particular bag and I was like, man, I'm like, I really want to buy this bag and, and I could buy this bag. But in the back of my mind, when I think about like my long-term goals, buying that bag wasn't the smart decision. And so immediately I said to myself, okay, what assets could I buy instead that would generate enough income so that that can purchase the bag for me? And so balling on a budget just for me means being very creative about your finances and making sure that you cover all the things that you need but then getting creative so that you can start to get the things that you want. Oh, I like that. Love it, love it, love it. So this has been such a joy to have you on and have this conversation. And I'm sure so many people will benefit from the tips you've gained on leadership and soft skills and even the salary negotiation. I want to ask you if you have any last words for listeners today. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to be on your podcast. Listeners out there, just make sure that before you even start thinking about the money, get very clear on your financial goals and your career goals. Because once you get clear on, you know, okay, this is how I want to show up to work. These are the type of people I want to work with. And then this is the type of money that I want to make. It helps to make very defined decisions concerning the salaries that you go after, being persistent in your negotiations, but then also just advocating for yourself for the titles that you want. So get clear on that stuff first, and then the tactics and the strategies will work after that. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Be sure to leave us a review and let us know any ideas you have for a future show topic. 
And if you really want to show us some love, share this episode with a friend and be sure to join our community online, milestonesmotivationandmoney.com. You can also follow us on Instagram at milestonesmotivationandmoney. Tune in next time.